Environmental Risk Communications in Oakland. Thanks for joining our webinar today on our counterparty defender software. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Our presentation will take a, a little over a half an hour, so we'll be done in about uh, 35 minutes using yesterday's duration as a guide. And we'll be um, uh, covering an agenda that's fairly straightforward, be looking at the key terms uh, that are applicable to looking at counterparty uh, risk of non-performance or default. I will be going over how our software works um, and reviewing the software itself and then displaying the types of reports that uh, the software is able to produce. Again, about uh, 35 minutes for total content. So plenty of time for questions. If, uh, if there are any, uh, again, housekeeping note, please use the chat feature or the question function in the GoToWebinar control panel. Just uh, type up anything you'd like to ask and we'll take it from there. With that, uh, my background is uh, uh, 20 years at Environmental Risk Communications. I'm the founder and CEO and author of a software tool called Remedy Defender, which has been used by 14 corporate user teams to estimate manage, display, and disclose their environmental uh, remediation liabilities. Uh, in that regard, we've uh, helped support roughly 60 uh, CPA audits, both internal and external, and looked at around 200 um, decision analysis projects uh, as well. We've also supported or are supporting four uh, U.S. Uh, port authorities that are complying with GASB 49, which is the public sector uh, analog to uh, ASC 410-30 formerly known in part as uh, SOP 96-1. We've uh, also developed a counterparty credit tracking system, uh, which we've used for the last 12 years for uh, uh, NPL site project management teams, uh, PRP groups. Uh, we've also uh, applied several project control systems to multi-party sites to help uh, uh, project owners and project teams, uh, project consultants, manage their work in the cloud from everything from uh, uh, cost estimation to uh, budgeting to invoice uh, and purchase order generation and payment generation. Um, my, I've got, uh, in terms of an educational background, an MBA from Northwestern and a bachelor's in business from Georgetown. Uh, so my educational background is in developing the software and applying it for use on environmental liabilities. That's all we've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, but my educational background means, in turn, I'm not an attorney, not a CPA, not an environmental consultant or expert. Uh, my background is a uh, is really just in working through the tools, policies, procedures that help uh, generate more accurate liability forecasts. So this tool hopefully is a good example of what kind of things we're capable of doing. So in terms of uh, the key terms that I want to stress for today, there's just two of them. Environmental county part counterparties are any party funding any portion of a multi-party environmental liability, which basically means any kind of environmental liability, but typically focuses on an environmental remediation party that has one or more PRPs, potentially responsible parties. In Washington State, they're also referred to as PLPs, potentially liable parties, uh, but the term is basically the same. It's not meant to be a strict circular definition. Um, it's meant to apply to any and all cleanups that have more than one parties, and that doesn't necessarily limit itself to two industrial companies sharing in the cost of the cleanup. The non-performance risk uh, refers to something defined in ASC 820. Uh, it's the risk that an obligation will not be fulfilled and affects the value at which a liability is transferred as well as the value at which a liability is placed on a company's books. So the non-performance risk means in turn uh, that premium that needs to go on top of the liability valuation for paying out monies to a third party. It's the premium that would be a place for uh, assuming the risk that, um, that parties will not pay their share. These, this uh, risk is, is actually spelled out pretty cleanly in ASC 410-30. I personally have not seen this aggressively audited, so I point this out with, uh, with some degree of caution. I don't see auditors hounding uh, our end users, our clients, for counterparty risk calculations. Uh, but I think we've seen uh, through trial and error that, that uh, having rules has never been a problem in the accounting side. It's the enforcement and it's the auditability of those, uh, those numbers that, uh, that, that's where the rubber hits the road. ASC 410-30-30-1B says uh, a company preparing a financial statement needs to consider or assess the likelihood that other PRPs will pay their full allocable share of a joint and several liability. Full stop. That's all that's in that paragraph. The next citation a few paragraphs down is, is, is more lengthy, so I'll just read the first and third sentences here as the most useful ones. And these and should, again, assess the likelihood that each PRP will pay its allocable share of a joint and several liability. So it says the same thing twice. Uh, more or less on the same page of ASC 410-30. But to continue a few sentences down, the key part is this assessment requires the entity to gain an understanding of the financial condition of the other PRPs and to update and monitor this information 
as the remediation progresses. I will editorialize for two seconds. I don't see auditors checking for this. But what we built Counterparty Defender to do, the software tool that we'll talk, be talking about today, is to take information from short-term credit forecasts that are available uh, more or less in the public domain, take that information, roll that forward with Monte Carlo modeling, and show how we can generate a long-term forecast that matches the duration of the, the, the spending risk with the duration of our understanding of the, uh, the, the credit quality of the counterparties. This requirement uh, that's in uh, the, the paragraph in the middle of the page, ASC 410-30-30-7, that paragraph word for word is the exact same paragraph that's in SOP 96-1, uh, paragraph 6.20. It's the exact same language. Nouns, verbs, punctuation, everything is exactly the same. It's not a new requirement. In other words, this requirement's been out there for at least 18 years. Uh, the other citations that I think are relevant are uh, found in ASC 820. Uh, particularly, let me read a paragraph, and I, actually not the paragraph, but just the first sentence of a very lengthy paragraph. I, I, I pulled out the rest of it. ASC 820-10-35-17, the first citation at the, at the top says, the fair value of a liability reflects the effect of non-performance risk. In other words, to have an estimate for a liability on the books requires that an entity discount it or add a premium, sometimes both, or for in this case today we'll be covering both, uh, where the liability needs to reflect the non-performance risk of other parties plus, in the second sentence here, uh, non-performance risk includes but may not be limited to a reporting entity's own credit risk. So if you think back on General Motors sliding into bankruptcy in June of 2009, uh, what it did not do was it did not discount its $300 million environmental reserve uh, to reflect the idea that it was going to be, it was less and less likely that it was going to be paying uh, uh, the $300 million environmental reserve that it had laid out. That environmental reserve ultimately turned out to be negotiated at $940 million, so it actually went up quite a bit in the bankruptcy process over the ensuing several years. But again, uh, we're not short of rules here. My point is environmental liabilities do have to conform with ASC 820 about fair value measurement. The middle paragraph, again, repeats the first one. Uh, so again, uh, ASC 820-10-35-18, when measuring the fair value of a liability, a reporting entity shall take into account the effect of its own credit risk, its credit standing, and any other factors that might influence the likelihood that an obligation will or won't be fulfilled. And that includes, and again, editorial, editorialized for a second, uh, the effect that uh, uh, regulators will not enforce the, 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 uh, the timetables or, or enforce the requirements that remediation be even performed. I uh, assert that that belongs in that, that paragraph as well. Uh, again, the last uh, citation that I've got, 35-25, valuation techniques used to measure fair value shall be applied consistently. That means looking at uh, one site one way and looking at another site another way in the same portfolio is not appropriate. Consistency is meant to apply. So who are counterparties? This is, this is a look into my mind. This is just my working list. Uh, but I think first and foremost, uh, environmental county counterparties are any other PRPs at a site where you as a PRP are acting as a banker. In other words, where your entity, your corporation is acting as the contracting vehicle and you're pulling money in from other PRPs and you're paying money out, basically you have a counterparty exposure because not, not just on the part of joint and several liability, but because you, your company's written a contract with a vendor, the vendor thinks it has a deal with you, you're in turn asking for reimbursement from other PRPs, you've got counterparty risk, actually acute counterparty risk, maybe not material, maybe not significant, but you certainly have short-term counterparty risk of those counterparties not reimbursing you while you have to contractually uh, pay the vendor that's performing work. That's just the nature of how the money's moving, how it's, how it's contracting, and these are fairly typical counterparty risks that are out there today. Um, again, exposure to working capital being one of those, uh, one of those key parts. But the more broader ones where, the, where environmental liabilities go often, uh, undocumented, unestimated, unquantified, or where there are successor owners of your properties, and those successor owners have, have assumed or taken on or provided indemnification, asserting that they will pay for future environmental remediation work. However, if they don't, joint several liability tells us that those properties can and do boomerang back to previous owners. Uh, and as a predecessor owner, if you have the deep pockets, you can find that you're back to, uh, to owning that site. 
predecessor owners of properties as well are uh, our environmental counterparties. If they promise to perform work as part of a purchase and sale agreement, your company buys a property. A predecessor owner uh, is only, again, as good as its, uh, its credit quality if it, if it undergoes financial stress and, stress and is under, unable to keep a promise due to bankruptcy. Again, you can find yourself uh, uh, paying for 100 cents on the dollar or paying, uh, if there's a claim submitted in bankruptcy, maybe as little as 50 or, or 70 cents on the dollar. But still, predecessor owners are, again, a type of counterparty to the extent they're providing indemnification about the condition of a property that you've, uh, you've taken over. JV partners and working interests in the oil and gas industry are other examples of parties where you, you are going to find yourself in business to, to resolve an asset retirement obligation or an environmental liability well after uh, the useful life of, uh, of a given asset. Classic one is PRPs on a multi-party site cleanup. Uh, again, this is like a circle of cleanup, uh, uh, NPL site cleanup, where several companies uh, team up together to share in the future study and remediation of O&M costs. Uh, but you may also find that your organization as a PRP on a site like that is in business with the insurers uh, as certain entities uh, uh, sunset their business activities, they dissolve, they, 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 uh, they reassign employees to other businesses, uh, remove all the assets uh, from a given business. Uh, that business may be going through what's called business exit, and you may find that the insurer is the last remaining PRP, not the uh, uh, the predecessor Fortune 500 company that you thought you were in business with on a multi-party site cleanup. Seeing federal agencies that pay for stranded or orphan share uh, uh, applications are also environmental counterparties and uh, environmental counterparties as we saw with the uh, the city of Detroit. Uh, state and, state, and uh, state agencies can and do uh, go through Chapter 11, um, uh, Chapter 11 uh, analog proceedings which are called Chapter, uh, chapter 9. Uh, municipal bankruptcies are, again, an unfortunate part, unfortunate part about how to do these calculations. Um, but again, it's, we're, we're just here really to identify which types of counterparties we, uh, we do have to be aware of. Uh, just to, to round out the list, I'll, I'll skip the rest of these uh, uh, items, but, but center on these, uh, the next two regarding landfills. Landfills that are taking waste from your current projects and land, landfills which took waste from your projects in the past are also your counterparties. If you're working with nationally recognized, publicly traded counterparties, you're able to see how healthy they are, what their scale is, how large they are. Uh, the two larger companies in the U.S. are Waste Management and um, uh, Republic Services. Uh, up in Canada, uh, provincial ownership of landfills is, is quite ordinary, and the, the obligations in Canada are stated such that when the, uh, the waste and soil is, are, are deposited at the provincial landfills, uh, the taxpayers of the province, uh, in a sense, are the long-term guarantors. They are your counterparties. Uh, so again, that's a different type of deep pocket altogether. However, if you're working with a privately held, family-owned uh, landfill in the U.S. that offers rock-bottom rates, um, one, again, one of the, uh, the aspects of considering counterparty risk is you may be drawn back into eventually cleaning and closing out that landfill, providing a cap and cover on that landfill because they did not provide the long-term asset retirement obligation funding for closing that facility. Uh, so just in terms of defining counterparties, what I wanted to look at for a second is an event called the, uh, uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It's also referred to as the Condo Prospect uh, in the Mississippi Canyon, uh, Block 252. Uh, the owners of the well, which you may not have heard of, uh, the, the ownership information is actually in the public domain. The well owners uh, at the time of the uh, fortunate uh, incident. We're 65% British Petroleum, 25% uh, Anadarko uh, since bought out by BP, so it's now 90% uh, BP, 10% Mitsui of Japan. So those were the owners of the asset, the, uh, the, the prospect, but also coincidentally the owners of the spill, the owners of the liability associated with the spill. The other four entities that I've got logos here captured for are, are entities that have, have settled with different, uh, different agencies or with the well owners for their associated liabilities. Transocean is the owner of the uh, Deepwater Horizon rig. Um, Halliburton uh, provided the well casing. Weatherford provided the, uh, the blowout preventer. Cameron provided the uh, uh, subsea shutoff devices and well caps. They've each provided different uh, uh, settlements or their insurers did uh, for components of the liabilities. My point in bringing up these parties is to say one incident, one industrial incident here, uh, you know, the largest spill in the Gulf of Mexico, one incident has brought together these seven different companies uh, in finding that 
that their ability to pay was reflected by the other's ability to pay. Uh, we've all seen that BP has, has, has stood up the most and had its uh, um, uh, been the most visible with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, providing uh, for claims and, and negotiating directly with uh, state and federal uh, government agencies. However, they weren't alone. They had other parties uh, sharing, uh, to some degree, uh, with the environmental liability associated with that unfortunate event. So my point again with the Macondo prospect, uh, the Macondo well, is that uh, you know, it may look like there's only one party funding the work, but um, uh, additional information, ad additional digging can, undercover, can uncover several others are involved. So let's move forward and cover how uh, Counterparty Defender, our software tool for demonstration here today, works. First of all, we collect key inputs, and it's just three areas, just three areas. Um, the expected cash flow of the project or projects, uh, the allocation assumptions, so the allocation data as it's understood to be today, the current credit ratings for each counterparty, or basically the identity of each counterparty. From there, ERCI goes away, finds the credit data, and uh, uh, runs that data through our forecasting uh, engine. And in turn, we generate reports on a single site basis, which looks at the counterparty risk of default for uh, each of those individual counterparties, which is, again, part of what's in ASC uh, 410-30. And then we look at the probability or the risk of default of our own entity, which uh, is, is in no cases zero. No one is immune from, from uh, the impacts of default. Every company, regardless of credit rating, has some probability of default. And I include any company at all can go through default. We also are able to generate portfolio-wide reports, uh, which look at uh, uh, the answers to the questions that are displayed here as follows. What's the sum of all the counterparty risks we have with company XYZ over the next 10 years? And that looks at every site in the entire portfolio. We're able to answer that question. How does that sum of counterparty risks compare with the credit limit in place at our operating business units for company XYZ? So this enables one, uh, for example, one chemical company to say, okay, we, we, we love doing business with company X. However, on the environmental side, we have $10 million of environmental counterparty risk, whereas when we sell products to them, you know, we, we only have a credit limit of $5 million, and that's due in 30 days. Here we have $10 million of environmental liabilities due over the next 30 years. So we, in a sense, have credit extended to that tune. That is a comparable to what we have in our operating business. What can we do about that? We're also able to answer questions like, uh, uh, what is the value of indemnifications coming into us from other parties? How good are those indemnifications? Are they getting stronger as those counterparties get stronger, or are they weakening as those counterparties uh, dissolve and go away? How does this compare to the indemnifications that we have provided out to other parties? Uh, are they outweighed? Are we providing more indemnifications than we are taking in? And next, uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a more useful question, uh, are there indemnifications worth cross-cancellation? In other words, do we have indemnifications out to some parties where we're expecting indemnifications back in from them as well? And can we enter into a side negotiation to basically cancel out dollar-for-dollar dollar, uh, indemnifications from each other's books? Can we go into a sort of a clearinghouse negotiation and resolve this? From there, let me give you a sense of how the software itself works. Uh, each company out there uh, has a credit score. That credit score is associated with a financial stress score. That financial stress score is sort of like a, an SAT score or any other, other type of credit score. It ranges from a low end of the range to the high end of the range. It's basically zero percentile to the hundredth percentile. And that in turn equates to something called a financial stress score class, FSS class one through five. So the weakest companies that are out there um, are in stress score class five. The healthiest companies are in stress score class one. Uh, so just to, I wanted to, to give you some sense of where the household names or publicly traded companies are out there. Airlines are unfortunately all clustered together on the low end of the financial stress score class. That is the meaning they're the weakest. They have actually uh, all been through bankruptcy recently and are under threat of, of actually going into bankruptcy in the near future as well. <clears throat> Healthier companies that are in the middle of the curve are, are household names like Google, Bolero, Walmart, and Adarco, and Boeing. Uh, companies that are, are blue chip as well as uh, in the financial stress score class two group are Chevron, Apple, ExxonMobil, Johnson & Johnson, IBM, and Microsoft. On the top end are privately held companies. Here I've got my company is actually in the, uh, the 90, 95th percentile or 96th the last time I checked. The 98th percentile is a, a privately held company that sells uniforms down in, uh, uh, 
industrial uniforms down in Irvine, California. Uh, they've got the best score of any company that we track on a routine basis. Uh, again, they've probably got debt that's public, that, that's, that's not publicly held, and that's personally guaranteed by the individual owners, just like ERCI's debt is, is personally guaranteed by the owners. So again, that's very different from a publicly traded company that could file Chapter 11 for a variety of circumstances and, in a sense, default on its debt. The privately held companies don't have that luxury. So again, if we step back and take the financial stress score class data, what we've done is uh, we built a Markov chain Monte Carlo model around that, which is something that uh, I won't go into in detail here, but there's a great Google page on Markov chain, uh, Markov chains and Markov chain Monte Carlo modeling. The basic idea of a Markov chain is that there is a transition matrix. There's something called a transition matrix showing the flows of companies from, for example, financial stress score class three to financial stress score class two. And here, this graphic shows that, that the probability of a company in 12 months going from stress score class 3 to stress score class 2, that is getting stronger, uh, is 21% just in one year. Over time, it compounds to be a, a, an interesting range of numbers, range of outcomes. There's actually a 2% chance that a company that's starting off as a, a stress score class 3 today will wind up stress score class 1 just next year. There's also a 51% chance that a company that's three today will be also a three next year. 50% chance that a company that's three today will wind up as a four uh, next year. And then going vertically, there's a 10% chance that a company that's three today will go into default, that will go into business exit and no longer be on the stage uh, this time next year. Those are the statistics that uh, ERCI uh, acquired from uh, Dun & Bradstreet, which is based on their experience in working with, uh, with their own uh, database of companies and it also aligns pretty closely when we, we map out all of, the, all of the contingent probabilities for all of the financial stress score classes. It averages out to be a default rate of around 8.4%, which matches up with the U.S. Census Department's business exit rate that they uh, do as part of their annual survey for the U.S. Commerce Department. What does that mean? It means a company that, like Google that starts off today at the middle of the pack that there's a probability that eventually it will migrate to become a class two or a class one and that there's also a corresponding probability that they'll migrate down to a class four or a class five or even go through default. So there are associated contingent probabilities that we, we built a Monte Carlo model chain to, uh, to, to calculate. And that's our, our forecasting engine, which fits into our, um, uh, the way our software is laid out, which I'll demonstrate here in the next slide or two. Um, so we start off again with the initial calculation. We put on the Markov chain data. We apply the project cash flows. Those are our three inputs. We put that information into our forecasting engine and in turn generate our estimate. So here I'm going to demonstrate our software with, with this case study information. We've got uh, uh, five PRPs uh, paying into a, a cleanup project. Everyone has an equal 20% share. We've got $10 million in future costs over the next 10 years. So in other words, the group is paying in uh, 200K per party per year or a million dollars for the whole group per year. So therefore, our current share on a current current dollar basis, no inflation, no discounting, is we're expecting a current value of $2 million for us. Let's also assume that we've got a random mix of credit ratings, that uh, we're the best of five, we're financial stress score class one, uh, the PRPB is in class two, C is in class three, D is in class four, and so on. So again, our initial reserve starts off with the idea that we've got $2 million of cash calls, therefore our reserve ought to be $2 million before we factor in uh, the associated risk of counterparty default. With that, I'm going to exit out as gracefully as possible uh, out of Excel. Uh, I'm sorry, out of uh, PowerPoint and switch over to Excel here. And here is our, our model. And I've, uh, I've got a fast version that works in a tool called Model Risk, which is built by a tool uh, from Bose Software. Uh, that actually is built around doing Markov chain Monte Carlo modeling uh, and built around the transition matrix and works very fast. I built a version in Excel here and using crystal ball that works uh, just the same way, but is, uh, you know, transparent calculations are, are much easier to see here. So here, for example, I'll pull up the, um, uh, the transition matrix for a class three company. And here we see that, uh, that one or two percent that a company will turn into a class one. Here we've got that uh, roughly 20% probability that a company that starts off as a three will wind up next year as a class two. Here's that 51% probability in the middle bar uh, that a company that's a class three today will be a class three next year. And again, the remaining probabilities are the, the, the remaining uh, distributions that you see off here to the right. 
So with that, let me step back and say this is how each of these components work. And then we've got some logic built into uh, each of these uh, components. So as a company moves left to right, each one of these uh, is, uh, is years going off. B, C, D, E, F are years going off to the right. Uh, that's our calculation engine. Uh, here in the next section of the model, I'll let the, the model catch up here for a second. Here we've got each of the PRPs. We're starting off in year zero with our corresponding credit class. And here we're identifying what credit class those companies will be in next year. And in turn, we'll, we're playing uh, the musical chairs part of the uh, calculations to show what our costs are between us and them and the group costs between, uh, as allocated between us and them. So normally we expect to, to pay a 20% allocation of the million dollars per year and that in turn yields the net payments. Uh, in the section below, I, I create the forecasts uh, that we uh, display later on and then recalculate on a payment basis what our payments are and then what the payments are for each of the corresponding parties, B, C, D, and E. So if we just do one uh, step forward in terms of one trial of Monte Carlo model, uh, you'll see here we've had one party go default, and that's PRP E. Uh, that's in class five. They've gone away uh, a year down the road. So everyone's share is now 250 k and that moves forward to the next year and the next year. And then like a musical chairs game, then we lose another party. We lose PRP C. And so now we're paying 333, 333, and then we lose another party. We lose PRP B like baby. Uh, and then it's just us and party D. Uh, party D in this time is, uh, is now a class four, which in this model run, in this uh, crystal ball trial. So we see that they're, they've gotten uh, uh, no change in their financial health, but in turn, they more or less stay in a four, a three, and a two. Uh, in the succeeding years in this Monte Carlo trial, and they end the, uh, the exercise, they end the 10th year as a uh, in, in PRP group two. We remain one throughout, and so again, we're, uh, uh, we're splitting the cost at the very tail end, 50-50. So that's one trial. Here's the next trial, again, chosen at random. And in this case, we go out, uh, uh, we're, we go into uh, first year as a class one, next year class two, and then we go into default. In year three. So our payments go 250, uh, 250, and then zero. So our aggregate payment is 500k of our of our $2 million liability, and then we're out and our share gets absorbed by others. Next trial is we remain in place. Uh, PRPB also remains in place, but the others uh, die off. So our corresponding share goes from 250 to 333 to 500 and then stays there uh, going forward. Next Monte Carlo trial, uh, a slightly better story. We have other parties we have uh, uh, in place. We have 200K for several years as our share, then 250, then 333, and then going off to the right end of the scale. You see our share just, just tops out at 333. So again, that gives a sense of what each of the trials does. Now I'll tell the software to go forward and do its thing on a To do a full set of trials, and I'll try and uh, uh, suppress this uh, so it runs a little bit faster. Um, we've got it set up to do 10,000 trials to just show what's going on with the, the calculation engine up above and the rates of default. You see in some years, you know, we go away. In some years, the other parties all go away. So again, that provides a robust range of what the calculations uh, are expected to occur, uh, that how they're expected to occur in real life. Um, so the calculations that we've got going on on the left side of the screen here uh, are we've got a baseline calculation of what we think our liability uh, is, and then we've got an expected value showing what we think our ultimate payments are going to be. In some cases, we go bankrupt early on and our, our actual payments are zero. In some cases, everyone else goes away and we wind up uh, paying uh, over $5 million, perhaps even uh, the full $10 million ourselves. But again, the steady state goes back to what we think our calculations are going to look like and what I want to focus in on is uh, these calculations down here. This is the associated data that we really want to pull out of the model. I apologize here for a second. Um, so our delta from baseline is we expect to, to have $2 million coming from each party. What they actually pay on an expected value is this basis. So we expect to pay a premium. These other parties can expect to pay either a premium or a discount based on, again, a weighted average of their health. The net impact is that we expect to uh, uh, 
just for our own situation is we expect to pay uh, 663 k on top of the $2 million that we've got in our reserve. That means that our calculations, if we go back to uh, uh, the presentation for a second, You'll bear with me as I get back down to where we left off. As we expect uh, uh, to offset for our own risk, and I've, I've ballparked our own risk at 153k, we expect to pay. Uh, we expect to see the counterparty risk of default to be around 800k, which is that that 600k number displayed, marked up for uh, the 15k, 150k rather, of our own default. In other words, our net reserve balance will be 2.65 million, that expected value that we saw displayed there a moment ago. Uh, so again, the old way we would have displayed the $2 million of cash calls and said that's what we know. With this tool, we're able to step back and say, no, uh, to, to comply with ASC 410-30, we should add 800 k to the reserve to count, up, to count up the impact of counterparty default, subtract out 150 k from that total uh, to show the expected value of our own default and come up with a new revised reserve that's far more durable of 2.65 million. That, does, that isn't necessarily good news for someone who wants to keep reserve balances down, but for a, for a company that wants to have the most accurate reserve balance possible instead of the lowest possible reserve number, they should go with 2.65 million instead of 2.0 million. That's it. That's the essence of the calculations and how the software works. Uh, one of the, the uh, uh, sensitivity analyses that I did on these uh, numbers is I looked at when the risk peaked and troughed for different respective PRPs. I found a fairly intuitive uh, outcome. The healthier the company, the more likely it was that the, the, uh, the, uh, the cost times the probability of default uh, peaked in the middle of the, uh, of, of the duration of the project. Um, the less healthy the company was, the earlier the risk peaked. So what this instructs us to do is that we're, if we're really worried about controlling counterparty risk, we would do something special in managing the counterparty risk of D and E. That is the companies that are in the, the bottom third of credit scores today. So we'd focus our attention on counterparties that are in the bottom third of the economy. Not everybody, but in the bottom third. We do something about those particularly acute uh, situations of companies that are, that are in the bottom 5% of the economy. That's where our bankruptcies are probably going to come from. That's where our, most of our financial risk is going to be, not in the exceptional circumstances of a very healthy company going down quickly in flames, but in the companies that are dissolving, unwinding, that are in financial stress today, eventually being unable to make their cash calls over the next 10 years. That information, in turn, is, is going to be uh, useful in displaying uh, on a site-specific basis in a reserve watch list of uh, prospective future reserve increases. Uh, this is a tool that ERCI strongly advocates our, our clients to use, and we've got a great degree of success of helping uh, portfolio managers and their, their management above uh, understand what's, what the dividing line is between what's in the reserve and what prospective reserve increases are. So again, if numbers don't rise to becoming material and don't deserve to be put in the reserve, at least they deserve to be put on a watch list of future prospective reserve increases. And here, a, a project management team and a, a portfolio manager is able to clearly articulate where the counterparty risk fits into the rest of the risks that an organization faces. So my point in displaying this data is to say counterparty risk is, is, uh, is, app, is applies the thinking required under ASC 820 for fair value measurement. It shows what, what makes up a premium, because it shows uh, where that, that uh, risk in part is coming from. And it goes well beyond uh, the typical time constraints of a reserve horizon, like 5, 10, 20 years. And it looks for, in turn, something that's very valuable for a company, and that is concentrations of risk, where it has too much risk riding on the financial health of a handful or a small group of parties. So looking for concentrations of risk is one of, the, again, the uh, useful outcomes of looking at uh, counterparty defenders. So where are the applications for this information? Well, first and foremost, reserve calculations and validation. Merger, divestiture, and acquisition negotiations are another useful approach to this uh, process. So again, figuring out what value belongs in the reserve and another, time, another place to use this information is in determining uh, how to value the environmental liabilities for properties coming in, assets coming in, or assets or, or properties leaving the portfolio. This information is also useful in asserting claims before litigation or doing pre-litigation claims. 
uh, filing a Chapter 11 or robust Chapter 7 bankruptcy claim, and then also in uh, performing CERCLA cash in and cash out negotiations. The value proposition for doing our work, just in the very high level, is we do this work for around $1,000 a party with a big standard deviation around that if a company is privately held, has lots of turnover, uh, has successors and assigned issues, uh, it has declining liquidity. We find that the cost of managing an individual PRP can be three to five times that per year. Uh, if a company is publicly traded, has a, a good public, uh, I'm sorry, good documentation of successors and assigned issues, uh, we can look at websites just as fast as anybody else and keep the cost to, uh, to one labor hour per year or less. So again, uh, the benchmarking uh, that we have in place for costs is we can track uh, PRPs for around $1,000 per party. We do the typical scope of work for tracking uh, a PRP group. Tracking a dozen parties, our cost benchmark is around fifteen k per year. The expected value of perfect information in turn drives whether uh, this information is more value and valuable in other circumstances. So our benchmarks are, if we're looking at a reserve change of a million dollars or a watch list update of a million dollars, we find that understanding that information for around 50K is a good benchmark. In other words, spending $15,000 to look at a million dollar reserve delta uh, captures the value of perfect information because otherwise it would be around 50, five zero thousand, fifty thousand dollars to, to uh, that, that's the worth of that information. And again, if you're spending $15,000 on information that's worth $50,000, you're again capturing 35k worth of value. Using purchase accounting post acquisition, uh, it's useful to apply a corporation's tax rate, usually 25 to 40 percent, times the reserve delta. Let's say that's a million dollars. If we're again trying to track accurately a million dollar reserve increase, it would be worth 250k to 400k to track that reserve increase accurately. Our benchmarks in working at ERCI is that we deploy software where the payback period is always, always less than 90 days and the return on capital employed is over 200% per year. That's our benchmarks. So we, we uh, usually uh, find ourselves in situations where the client is saving more than our software costs before it's deployed. Um, nonetheless, uh, FASB, uh, GASB, and International Accounting Standards Board tell us that calculation, calculations are not only uh, good business, but they're a compliance issue. They're mandatory. Again, we don't see, not to editorialize, but we don't see auditors hounding our clients for this information. But we're frankly uh, more than a little confused why there isn't a robust market for the information that we're able to now generate with our software. That concludes our presentation. Uh, it took us uh, 38 minutes to get through, but thank you for, for sitting through this. We hope it's been useful uh, uh, content. We'll stand by for a few minutes of questions. Let's stop our recording at this point.